Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. You too. You know, radio's not always like this. The no. Screaming crowds, the bright lights. Not for you, maybe? No. For me, every day, every day in my damp, dark recording studio in Toronto with Michael Enright banging at the door saying, I need to get in, you know? That's what it feels like every single day. And usually it doesn't matter what you wear, but tonight I had to wear my son's London, Ontario t-shirt. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, thanks for making the big long trip to be here today. I appreciate that. <laughs> it was raining. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I understand one of the things you love about living here is how productive you get to be, is that right? You know, if I was in some big, glitzy, international, mega city of the 21st century, there'd be a lot to distract me. But as it is, I've had 21 years here and have written quite a lot because there's not quite so much getting in the way. <laughs> That's a compliment, right? I think so. Yeah, that's, that's, so. We're going to call it a compliment. I, I think. mean, do you want London? Do you want to be a city where writers just party or where writers write, you know, award winning screenplays? You know, take your pick. <laughs> where, do you, where do you like to write in London? Well, I write at home on a treadmill desk. Um, what? I, and yeah, you know, to fit a bit of exercise into your day, I, okay. I tramp along on this treadmill desk. Um, I frequently work in our local cafe, The Black Walnut. <laughs> Which I have to say, best pastries this side of the Atlantic, in are, my experience. Are they paying and you? Are they paying you tonight to say that? By the way, no. You're getting free pastries never for the had rest a free of your pastry, life. But I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> um, I frequently work, um, you know, at the YMCA here. I wrote one of the saddest scenes in Room in the YMCA while stashing my kids in the free childcare there. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I write at uh, Earl Nichols Skating Arena, you know, at the uh, tennis playing center at Western. You know, wherever I can put my kids into a, in, into a class that lasts at least an hour, I get a bit of work done. Wherever you can get rid of your youngsters for an hour, you'll get some writing done, I understand. So, it's mutually beneficial. But is, is it ever a bit surreal to be, I mean, I think about, we were talking about, you know, the Academy Awards, we were talking about the big Hollywood red carpets. Is it ever a bit surreal to be working on these kind of potentially pretty gigantic scripts and pretty gigantic books? Here, here at home? No, uh, it's been wonderful living here. Um, I, what you really want, to, um, Trollope, the writer, said that you, no, I'm getting it wrong, I'm sorry, it was um, Flaubert, he said you must live like a bourgeois so that you can be wild in your art. So I've had a very bourgeois 21 years living here. Um, I've, I found it a really easy place to get to know people. There's this endless flow of interesting new people coming through the university where my partner teaches. So it's been a fantastic base, actually. And, you know, it's such a, a diverse place, far more diverse than people realize. Mm. Um, my kids have been in the French school system, for instance. It's a multilingual city. So um, I've had a great time here. And above all, I got to shed that burden of being Ireland's only lesbian. <laughs> you know? So. It's worth underlining the obvious that, you know, multicultural Canada allows us multiculti people to come here and drop the burden of our identity and just get on with however we want to spend our day. So God bless Canada. You know, if, you, if, if they're not giving you free pastries, I'm going to buy you free pastries for life for that. That's what I'm the government of Canada should subsidize your pastries. Um, your last uh, big uh, film was, was, was Room. You just mentioned it. You know, after it scooped up a bunch of Oscar nominations, you turned the story into a play. Um, it was just announced last month, so that play is going to have its North American premiere here in London. That's right, the Grand Theatre. How does, that, how does that feel to be able to... Fantastic. And the Grand is, is um, having an exceeding... An ex a particularly lively few years since Dennis Garnum, Garnum took it over. And um, we're going to rework the play, make it more Canadian, all Canadian cast, make the language suit Canada. Um, and it's going to be perfected here and then moved to Toronto at the Mervish. So the grand is being the springboard for this whole North American production. You know, that's very it, what's surprising to me to that is that authors don't often, I've spoken to a number of authors who have said things to me like, well, you know what, it, it got adapted into a play, it got adapted into a film, I'm hands off, I'm just going to stay home and check my mailbox every now and then. But it seems like you, it, it's, it's important for you to be involved in these things, right? Very much. I love storytelling in any form. And um, to me, what you have to have is a real enthusiasm for adaptation. Instead of trying to protect your work from those nasty producers, you know, you have to see it as a chance to, to tell the whole story all over again, playing to the strengths of whatever the new medium is, you know? Right. Like, what's the most theatrical thing we can do with Room? Whereas the film was really naturalistic because film is really strong on that. Mm -hmm. 
So mm -hmm. each new art form is a chance to you know, tear up your story and start again, and that's thrilling. So, I mean, you have this big play coming up soon. You've been nominated for an Oscar. You have a bunch of film and TV projects in development. But from what we've been saying, it sounds like your life here in London is kind of like anybody else's. <laughs> you know? Just you know, like any other Academy that Award daily grind up. Did you make the kids' school lunches? No, I thought you were the main, made the kids' school lunches. That's the same worldwide. I also, I also hear you have a book club. Of course, this place is riddled with book clubs. I have, I have visited at least 15 different book clubs here in London, Ontario. Are, you know? are you, is your book club a little intimidated that you're in their book club? <laughs> Oddly not, Tom. No, no. They're not intimidated at all. They're called the Furies, and we are such an old book club. I don't mean we're personally old. We've been going for so long, I can't actually remember how old we are. And they have very little respect for my opinion over theirs. You know? <laughs> they like to ask me for, t for tips about things like, does the writer pick that terrible cover, they might say to me. So they oh, want a bit of inside knowledge, but they have no respect for my views. You don't flex on them? You don't go like, hey, you know what? I, I disagree with it. And, you know, Academy Award right here, Man Booker right here. Karen, you know? No, because, you know, <laughs> every book reader is, you know, the expert on whether the book worked for them. Uh, do they ever bring up your books? Occasionally, they'll do one of my books, and it's really awkward. No, I, they I do your books? I try and arrive late so that they have a chance to, you know, bitch about it over the hors d'oeuvre. Hold on, they'll, your book club will sometimes pick your books to discuss? Yeah, that's that embarrassing, is, eh? You that, can imagine. I can imagine, yeah. yeah. I'm going to switch book, book clubs. Someone <laughs> wouldn't do that for you. Um, and, and I hear you have a brand new novel coming out. That's month, right, right, yeah. Um, twice in the last five years, um, we have uh, disloyally moved away from London, Ontario and lived in France for a year. We went to Nice twice. So um, I've written a novel all about that sort of contrast between uh, North America and France. So it's about a 79-year-old man going to France on a long-awaited trip, and then at the last minute, he gets this 11-year-old foisted on him, an obnoxious 11-year-old. Mm -hmm. So it's the sort of distillation of every frustrating travel experience with my children that I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> you can make them read it and say, you did that. You did that to me. They are endlessly useful, you know? Is that so? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do they yeah know I've been squeezing books out of them for the last 15 years, you know? <laughs> I've got a whole children's series. You know, Room was inspired by, you know, dull days child minding in London, Ontario on a Sunday morning. <laughs> that feeling of, you know, motherhood is a prison. So, honestly... Everything they've done, every way they have irritated me or vice versa for the last 15 years, I have turned into prose. You know, it's the most useful thing you can do for your writing career is have kids. Have they, have, have they read any of them? Oh, um, yeah, they've read the kids ones. My 11-year-old my Una kind of edits them. She's quite controlling about the plot. In fact, it doesn't really feel as if they belong to me anymore, you know? What do you mean she's controlling about the plot? Well, she'll say, no, you can't do that in book three, you know? So let me understand this. You talk about how idyllic it is to live in London, Ontario. You're getting no free pastries. Your book club's <laughs> criticizing your books. And now your kid's criticizing the plot. Yeah, it sounds idyllic out here. I mean, it sounds fantastic. <laughs> Um, uh, before we let you go, I wanted to ask you about this. Um, Brie Larson, who uh, is starring in the movie adaptation, who starred in the movie adaptation of Room, is now pretty much the biggest movie star in the world. In, in, I know, we all went to see her the other day. In Captain Marvel, yeah. Yes, we posed with her cardboard cutout in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> that must be surreal for you, hey? Oh, even at the time we could tell she was going to go far, but um, what, what I enjoyed most about Brie doing Room is that um, there was a day that she possibly drank a, little, broke, she drank a little bit of broken glass. There was, you know, there was a glass water bottle, the top what? was crumbly, and yeah. she took a swig from it, and then she said, I think I've drunk broken glass. And so they dashed her off to emergency in Toronto, and she was seen immediately, and they said, well, they couldn't really tell, it didn't show on the x-ray. So she came back, and she did the whole day's filming. See, that's the opposite of a prima donna. That's why Captain Marvel is going to go very, very far. That's how she got her powers. Um, but before we let you go, if, if people listening to this who maybe haven't been to London like I hadn't, which I got booed for, um, <laughs> haven't been to London, Ontario, what's one thing they should know about this place? Well, a friend of mine described it as the Cinderella Festival capital of Canada because our festivals are many and brilliant and they're just the right length. It'll be like, you know, three days. We've got the Forest City Film Festival, the Fringe Theatre Festival, the London, Ontario Lesbian Film Festival, um, the Sunfest, you know, just, it'll be three days in one place, just enough. Whereas in your big cities, you get a bit overwhelmed with oh. two-week pop-up festivals, you yeah, know? give me a break. Our festivals are just magic. That's my favorite answer I've ever gotten to that question. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, give it up again for Oscar-nominated screenwriter, playwright, and author on London's own Emma Donahue, everybody.